this point, we'll go ahead and move on to the questions. Um, <clears throat> did have a couple come into the chat. We'll start with those and then uh, move on through um, into the Q&A questions. Um, the very first question that came in was uh, with regard to the final product from Verma filtration process. Will it enhance the mycorrhizae colonization in soil? Um, Dr. Degwa, is that something you might be able to address from uh, your understanding of these types of systems? Can you come again on that question, Joe? Yes. Uh, the final product from the vermin filtration process, will it enhance mycorrhizae colonization in soil? Well, I'm, I'm not aware of any, any standards to that effect. Uh, but based on the the population that you have of the microorganisms, it should actually enrich uh, the microbial life in the soil. Okay. Um, Gilbert or uh, Patrick, any, any further comments on that from you guys' understanding? Yeah, I mean, we've we've done a, some metagenomic analysis of some of our materials. It wasn't for um, dairy, it was for a different, I think it was a pepper processing facility. And um, I don't remember the particular species of micro, but there were a significant fraction of uh, nitrogen fixers we found. Um, and I do know if you just, because I did it actually when I saw your question popped up, uh, just Google mycorrhiza and vermicompost. And there are, do seem to be quite a few publications on that topic already showing that yes, it, it does enhance activity okay. in soils. All right, uh, second question that came in was, does the process eliminate pathogens such as E. coli or salmonella? So any studies been done to, to verify the effects on pathogens? Yeah, I mean, there, there have been studies done on that and we do collect, we've done more pathogen studies of treated water, um, for instance, for sanitary, Normally that is undergoing an actual tertiary treatment after our system. But so for instance, if you do take out vermicompost and you give worms some further time with it, it will reduce the pathogen load. Um, we actually did that with some sanitary castings that, that we removed from a system. And I think the pathogen levels were below what's required for like EPA 503B disposal. Um, so, and again, that's one of those things where if you just look for the literature, I know, I know for instance, um, there's been studies on how if you treat sludge, activated sludge, which is loaded with pathogens um, with vermicomposting, it does actually eliminate quite a bit of the pathogens. Um, I don't know that it does it to the level of thermophilic composting, for example. Um, but again, there's, there's quite a bit of information on that in literature also. Uh, uh, next question, probably Gilbert and uh, Dr. Degwa. Uh, what sort of climate does the dairy in, in Washington experience? Um, and how much of the year is it below freezing and how it, might that affect the vermifilter? So as we look at seasons of the year, getting in the colder temperatures in Eastern Washington, um, what kind of effect might we have on, on the system? So um, I, th I think Patrick will also have a contribution to this, but uh, what we've seen is in the colder, in the colder months, uh, the earthworms will, will kind of burrow in the bedding. So, they consume less of the material, so we we we, are, we 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 should see a reduction in the performance, uh, generally. But uh, on a on a warm hot day, system should be working fully. So it's a bit of a limitation in my own in my own opinion. Uh, but uh, it does not really um, it, it does not negate that the the technology is doing something in wastewater treatment, but I believe Patrick has something to add on to this. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, uh, Patrick could answer this question better because they have had the, the, the systems uh, uh, even at, at the Royal Dairy. 
and they have learned it a couple of years now. So I think they should be able to tell us uh, what happens during winter when it's a little bit, the temperature a little bit depressed. So Patrick. Yeah, so really the main challenge with it is not so much with the biology. So you don't get a kill off of worms, for example, but it's really engineering the piping such that you don't get issues with freezing water in pipes and breaks in pipes. Um, that has historically been a bit of a challenge in Washington, but we're looking at new ways of doing irrigation that would confront that issue. Um, but in terms of the worms themselves, I mean, you know, microbial activity does change with temperature, of course. Um, so I think there is some planning that has to go into the winter months. And, um, but in terms of harming the system, if, if that's kind of the question, it, it's, it's okay. I mean, it's, it's a pretty hardy biological system that can get through winters just fine. Okay. Um, uh, in your study, Gilbert, you looked at uh, earthworm density. So there's a question came up with regard to uh, density such as pounds of earthworms per cubic foot of bed. I think you described yours as so many, like 12,000 worms per cubic meter or something, but yeah. Um, so um, most standard, it's like a standard uh, parameter in vermifiltration, the earthworm density, and it's, it's always measured in worms per cubic meter of bedding. So uh, that's why our study was, was varying that that earthworm density to find out how the system performs. But what we observed is after 10,000 worms per cubic meter, any increment in that, in, that, in that density does not really influence the percentage. It does not influence the, the performance so much. So we are looking at anything between 10,000 to 15,000 as being uh, an ideal earthworm density. All right, uh, next question, I, I think this has already been answered uh, in a way when Patrick gave his presentation, but it asks the reduction in acreage needed um, for handling the nutrients. Uh, does that assume that the final, so um, excuse me, that the final solids products, screenings and verma, verma product were being moved or sold off farm, so. I believe so, because I know at Royal Dairy, our offtake partner, they purchased the material they turn around and you know resell it to other farms, other growers. It's it, as far as I know, it's not used on farm. Yeah. Um, in terms of composting the separated solids from the primary and secondary, I honestly don't know where that goes. Um, I mean, I think Royal Dairy uses some of it for bedding. I know historically they had done that, um, but yeah, it. I think it's fair to assume you're not introducing the vermi product and the composted solids back to that land that's being loaded with wastewater. Any, any estimates on a uh, percent of total nitrogen or phosphorus that would be moved off farm? In terms of, in those solids themselves? Yeah, well, in terms of total, total nutrients coming out of the cow and then therefore where that ends up is there like 50% gets moved off farm or? It's a good question. Um, I'd have to look at the nitrogen content in, for instance, our castings and, and, and figure that out. I don't have the number off the top of my head. Okay, all right. Um, next question had to do with installation costs. How does uh, the cost of a vermifiltration system compare to anaerobic digesters? Um, again, I probably can't give you numbers. I'd be glad to follow up with someone who did want actual numbers. I mean, I know it's significantly cheaper than an anaerobic digester system. And another important thing to consider is from what I understand, you know, I haven't worked with digesters a lot, but I know that they're not economically viable for dairies below a certain size. Um, and that's not really the case for us so much. Um, our, you know, our treatment system scales better for small dairies. Um, as well as large, um, but you know, I don't know. Potentially, you know, it's multiples cheaper than an anaerobic digester. Okay. Um, with regard to N two O emissions, nitrous oxide emissions, um, what what's known at this point? 
I know Gilbert did some uh, uh, measurements of that, so maybe he can speak to it. Yeah, so uh, the, the results I gave you were for ammonia and methane because we tried to measure N2O, uh, N2O coming off of the wastewater samples and it was, was really low. It was pretty low below our instrument uh, limits, so we kind of did not include that. Same thing happened on the bed, on the, on the vermifilter beds. We also measured how much, how much N2O is coming off of the beds. That's a different study that I didn't include here, but it was pretty low. Yeah, yeah. and I, I know there's another study um, that was done before Gilbert's. It was published in 2018. Uh, I know Lai, L-A-I is the, the lead author's last name and Frank Mitloner was on that study also. And I believe they, they were looking at nitrification, denitrification, and made into o measurements. So I'd refer the person to that paper as well. Okay, so when you, when you do a startup or whenever you're uh, rejuvenating a system, where do you get the worms? Um, so is this an Amazon.com thing or what do you do? <laughs> you probably can do that. But um, at this point, what we do is we've got enough operating systems that we just source them from our own systems. We, we try and source worms from common waste streams, right? So we won't take uh, worms from something that's been processing winery, wastewater, and inoculate a dairy system with that. We, we pull dairy worms for a new dairy system. Um, at Royal Dairy, we're also um, kind of building up and maintaining a nursery. So we're taking some of those separated solids from the primary screen and actually having sort of a supplemental system that's keeping high density worm material available, both to stock Royal and to you know, be prepared to stock new systems that we have coming up in Washington or Oregon. So, and it's the same when we, uh, when we take out the filter material and change it over, we're also re-inoculating that system with the same worms that were there before, uh, but just a fraction of it. So we'll, We'll basically take high density worm material we find because it's variable. It's not, we don't have homogenous populations throughout the total surface area. Um, but we identify, you know, the hot zones of activity. We pull that material out and then it gets reapplied to the new beds when you change the filter. Next question has to do with uh, combining a vermifiltration system uh, following a digester. Uh, what's the appropriateness, the un inappropriateness of uh, doing such matching and technologies? Yeah, so this is something that we're actually, I think in April, we just concluded a maybe a year long pilot study that was doing just this. Um, it was treating digestate from um, a system near Sunnyside, Washington. And I think there'll be a report available in the coming months, both on you know, the treatment efficiency, as well as I think they're gonna take the Vermi product out of it, do some growth experiments with it and see how well it performs. Uh, we got excellent results. Um, we were tracking you know, nutrients. So I think we looked at phosphorus, nitrogen, we may have looked at potassium as well, um, the different solids, you know, total suspended solids, total volatile solids. And you know our removal efficiencies were in the 80 to 90 percent or greater range. I will say that's you know that's a fairly new thing for us, and um, the loading rates at that particular system were were kind of low. I would say you know so I think there's more to be learned on what the highest loading, you know, kind of what, what Gilbert was showing is there's limits to how much hydraulic loading you want to do per square meter per square foot before you start impacting performance. And I think there's more work to be done to figure out where that point is um, when treating digestate. But the results so far are, far are promising. And, and, you know, we've been talking to digester companies about treating digestate. So I think it's a promising area for us. Okay. Uh, next question, speciation of wood chips. So is there a certain type of chips that uh, tree that you want to get your chips from? Yeah, we, we often use Douglas fir. Um, we've also used poplar, cottonwood, and um, spruce. 
you know, that's that's an interesting question and area for us as a company is availability of wood chips. You know, it can depend obviously on the region you're in, what's available. Um, so, but to date, Douglas fir is what we've used most. Um, but I know at Royal, for instance, we just finished changing out the filter there um, recently. And I think that's where we use some additional species of wood. Um, you know, in general, it's more about the size of the chip and making sure it's not something that has like antiseptic properties. Um, we don't want it to be difficult for biofilms to form on the material. Uh, uh, so Patrick, you had mentioned this 18 month cycle um, at uh, in Eastern Washington. And so there's a question with regard to that. Um, is the rate of percolation the only parameter and how much saturation can the worms tolerate? So you know, kind of how do you determine when you have to rejuvenate? What are the indicators? Yeah, I mean, that that is a major one because castings themselves will hold water. Um, so you definitely get a reduction in hydraulic conductivity as you accumulate more and more worm castings in the upper layer of the filter. Um, and so we, we want to get that out of there just to avoid standing water or, you know, rate of treatment decreasing too much. Um, but it's it's also something in terms of you you can see minor declines in treatment performance um, if you let the filter go for too long, and I think what that comes down to is because it's holding more water, sometimes you have to physically help the the top layer turn over or till it so to speak, and when that happens, you sometimes get water percolating too quickly, right? We'd prefer that it's a slower rate going through the filter, not a large volume, just channeling through the filter quickly because not as much treatment happens. Um, but right now, it, I'll be honest, it's, it's basically based on experience and the, the condu hydraulic conductivity in the filter as the main indicators of how frequently you do this changeover. Okay, and then we had two questions come in with regard to oversaturating systems. So in rainy locations in the U.S. Um, is, you know, natural rainfall going to create a, an issue with these open aerobic systems in terms of too much hydraulic rate? Yeah, I, I think it could if the filter's too old and it's not appropriately sized to account for that. Um, we, we really haven't built, at least in North America, you know, most of our systems are in California with the exception of a few that are in Washington and one in Oregon, though, besides, um, Royal Dairy, those are smaller units. They are covered. So you don't have the issue of rainwater directly hitting the bed. But we do always take that into account when sizing a system. And, and you know, it's really more about the solids loading. Um, I mean, there's a limit to the amount of, of hydraulic loading you want to do, uh, particularly if the filter is old and it's, it's not percolating as quickly. Um, but it's something that we take into account when we design systems. We're looking at doing a dairy system in Oregon right now. And I know that that was a parameter that the engineers took into account. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a different kind of challenge for sure. Okay. I think the last question we're gonna to take today um, online is uh, the solids content. So a reference uh, point for this question is that um, solids content of uh, manure may get up to 12 to 15% um, and still pumpable and stored in earthen basins. but um, so in, in contrast at 12 to 15 percent, what is the solids content that typically is going to go through a vermifiltration system? So I'd probably, if this person wants better numbers, please contact me and I'd be glad to provide them. Off the top of my head, I think the concentrations hitting our system um, in milligram per liter at least would be, for TSS, it'd be maybe in the range of 
I don't know, 8,000 milligram per liter, potentially up to 12 or 13,000 milligram per liter total suspended solids um, that's actually being applied to the top of our system. Yeah. So fair reduction in the solid yes. content. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, well, I think that's uh, where we're going to conclude for today. I thank everybody for participating and thank you for the speakers today. It was a, a very good webinar.